Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, uh, Wednesday morning, April the 20th. I'm glad to be here. This is one child to be a survivor to another. I'm just waking up having coffee and trying to wake up here. And uh, glad to be able to do these shows. You know, I'm not a counselor or a therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own blog talk shows and um, just talking about child abuse. And you know, this mor- the morning show is my healing journey. And I appreciate everybody who's uh, joining me and who's been listening to the shows. I appreciate it because, you know, and so I do a lot of shows, so I know it's hard to keep up with them. And so I appreciate people who are tuning in. And, um, you know, so I'm not, you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows. I'm talking about abuse, and abuse is this very sensitive subject, and most people, a lot of people, you know, may feel that you know, the, the information is upsetting or, you know, that not sure what I'm talking about if they haven't heard a whole lot about abuse. And it's just an upsetting subject, so I know, you know you have to listen at your own discretion and just know what's good for you to listen to. And if, if you're, you know, if you're a survivor who's just on your healing journey, just starting out, you want to be careful what you're listening to because it can trigger you, and you, you have to be careful um, and make sure you're in a safe enough place and feeling okay, you know, to listen to anything like this or any show like this, right, or any type of material like this. Um, and I just think that young people under the age of 18 should have someone listen to the show with you, make sure that you, you know, it's age appropriate for you because really this show there's a lot of adult content on my shows, on all of my shows, and because I'm addressing the issues of abuse and. Uh, you know, it's there's a lot of adult material and adult, that type of stuff, and I think depending on how young the child is, I think that it's, it could be age appropriate, you know, inappropriate for young children, right? So you have to make sure that you have permission to listen to my show from an adult, somebody who's older, who can help you make that decision whether you should be listening or not, and uh, you know, just have someone tune in with you and they can help you make the decision, right? So thanks everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. We're looking this week at the inner child, and that's. Mainly because I realized, like on the weekend, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a, you know, a therapist of any kind, and I, I'm just a, a survivor. <laughs> but just the reading that I do and the stuff that I see out there, um, and that I have seen for over the last like four years, I've noticed that there's a lot of talk about the inner child, and that, that you know, I I started to envision my inner child when I started reading about this stuff because I knew she was there. You know, it wasn't like. It wasn't like the just because I read about it, all of a sudden I thought, oh, I must have an inner child. Like I knew that she was there just from, you know, being on the planet this long and and being aware that I had this small person from so long ago who was still um, feeling so down, you know, so damaged and and wounded, right? And really, that's just my past, you know what I mean? That's just my little person that I was so long ago, right? And you know, I think that um, j- even just this weekend, I was just noticing that. I still have some work to do for my for my inner child, you know, trying to get in touch with the feelings that I had when I was young and especially a little, you know, a, a small girl, right, right around the age of, I'd say, six, seven, eight years old, somewhere in there. And, you know, try to comfort that little child that I was and try to nurture and self-soothe and that type of stuff. And it does, it has helped me. I don't know about anybody else, you know what I mean? But I know for myself, like, just being able to um, get, you know, to, to get back in touch with those feelings from so long ago and say to myself now as an adult, you know, that you know that I'm fine, that there's, you know, there's no more abuse. I'm not living in the abuse anymore and that my parents can't hurt me anymore and my sibling can't hurt me anymore. And that is kind of reassuring, you know, to um to think about, you know, if you put yourself back in the in your shoes when you whoever, you know, who what whenever and whatever happened, you know, you know, to cause you this grief and pain and this sorrow, right? Whatever's going on in your life, because we're all different. And so, you know, I, it, it did help me to do that. And I, I realized I do need to self-nurture and self-soothe for the person I am today even. You know, and it's, um, I mean, I do quite well. Like, I mean, I'm not not having, it, most people would think there's absolutely nothing wrong with my situation. Um, as far as, you know, my, my life, they might think I'm not doing all that great as far as my finances go. And that I could have done better, you know, to you know, at this age to have a house and a family and all this stuff, but, you know, that's, that stuff wasn't important to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, that's why I don't have it. If I wanted to, all that stuff, I would have probably gone and got it. Um, you know, it's I'm more on a spiritual journey, if anything, you know what I mean? So, um, mo- but most people that do know me personally think I'm, I'm okay, I'm doing great. And the thing is, is, you know, they don't see my inner child, but I do, you know what I mean? Like, they don't see that wounded child that I was so long ago. 
and uh, what happened to me as a child. You know, they might even know my story, but they still don't see that little person inside of me who is still crying and who's still upset and still, you know, uh, not happy about the way she was treated. So that's I was sort of looking at on the weekend, just sort of thinking about the fact that yeah, I do need to do some inner child work, and I. I have done a little bit, but I haven't done a whole lot, and I think I need to do more. And I think that will really help me to, um, to you know, to learn how to self-nurture and self-soothe and, and uh, get into that little person that I was so long ago and allow her to feel safe, you know, and to feel, you know, uh, comforted, right? That there's no one, there's no abuse now. There's nobody fighting. There's nobody, there, you know, there's nobody hurting anybody in my life, you know what I mean, which is, which is great, you know, for my own inner you know, so that's what we're looking at this week. And I found, you know, I found this article, and it's just on a web page, and I did pop that into the chat room, and um, it's kind of interesting. Oh, Gypsy Witch, hello! I'm glad that you can be here, my good friend. Um, and this particular website, about.com, they have a, a page called Healing Healing dot about com about dot com. So it's Healing dot about dot com, right? And there's some great stuff on there for about the inner child and whatnot. So if anybody wants to take a look at that, please do. I hope they will. This one particular article that I'm looking at, I'll give you the link here. It's such a lot. It's a very long link. I won't be able to read the whole thing out, but I'll just tell you where it is in the name of the article that we were reading yesterday. It's http colon forward slash forward slash healing dot about dot com. The name of the article is called um, "Loving the Wounded Child Within." And it's by Robert Burney, B-U-R-N-E-Y-M-A. And Robert Burney, like we were just reading the very first part of it yesterday, you know, and talking about our our past, like, you know, inner child and whatnot. He says, it is through having the courage and willingness to revisit the emotional dark night of the soul that was our childhood that we can start to understand on a gut level why we had we have lived our lives as we have, taking a look back, right? And I like what he's written here. He's written some, some interesting stuff, and you know, he says it's, it's when we start understanding the cause and effect relationship between what happened to the children that we were and the effect it had on the adults we became that we can truly start to forgive ourselves, right? And so it is only when we start understanding on an emotional level, on a gut level, that we are we're powerless to do anything any differently than we did, that we can truly start to love ourselves. And I think that's kind of interesting, really, because when we're, you know, children who, who are growing up in dysfunctional homes, abusive homes, like, you know, and possibly being abused in some way, it's not, you know, there's no way they can control that home. There's no way they can control the situation in the home. They're just children. So it's obviously not their fault. And many times, like, survivors take that role on, thinking, well, because they might have been told, if you were a better child, or I wouldn't have to treat you this way if you were blah, 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 or whatever. And I know I heard stuff like that growing up, but I knew it wasn't my fault. I just never really took on that role. That's what we were talking about yesterday. But I know that a lot of people probably do, and especially when they're told over and over that it was their fault or, you know, and it just you know, grilled into them that drummed into them that it was their fault and they might even take on take on some of that guilt. And um I know a lot of people probably do that. I know I didn't. I really I knew I put the blame because <laughs> I was holding my parents accountable the whole time, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't sitting there, you know, after you know, being abused, sitting there thinking, Oh, well if I was a better kid or you know, I could see what my parents were doing to my other siblings and I could see what they were doing to themselves and each other. So I thought, well, you know, this is that has really little to do with me, you know what I mean? This is their their issue, right? So I recognized that at an early age, so I didn't take on that guilt, you know? But I know that some people do, you know? But says that we, we he's just talking here about you know, his sort of probably him, his own self, whoever, you know, his own self or other people he tells. He says, we blamed ourselves for the things that were done to us and for the deprivations we suffered. There's nothing more powerful in this transformational process than being able to go back to the child who still exists within us and say, it wasn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You were just a little kid. And I think that's important, though, because I'm doing this inner child work, you know, that I have actually done that, gone back to her and said, look, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't your fault. And and, and you you were just a kid. You were stuck in this mess. You know, it's not it, it's not your fault. So I did do that, even though I didn't really take on the blame. I have actually done that inner child, a little bit of inner child work. And... Um, so he goes on to say that he's just talking. This this was written from Codependence: The Dance of Wounded Souls by Robert Burney. So it's a, it's a book that he has, Codependence: The Dance of Wounded Souls. And then he goes on to talk here on this webpage. He says, when we were three or four, we w- couldn't look around us and say, 
well, dad is a drunk and mom is real depressed and scared. That is why I feel so awful here. I think I'll go get my own apartment. So, like, at the age of three and four, you know, you're not, there's no possible way a child that small and that young, um, you know, can even make sense of dysfunction or abuse or, or anything like that going on in the home. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's it's hard on a child to grow up around that type of stuff, and it's hard to make sense of it, you know, when you're that young and you're that little. It's just scary, and things are confusing, you know what I mean? And it's not a, it's not a healthy, safe, nurturing environment. So it says our, our parents were our higher powers, and I guess he's talking here just mainly about parents, but, we're, you know, this could be any anybody who was the abuser in the situation. And he says our parents were our higher powers. We were not capable of understanding that they might have problems that had nothing to do with us. So it felt like it was our fault. And he says, we formed our relationship with with ourselves and life in early childhood. We learned about love from people who were not capable of loving in a healthy way because of their unhealed childhood wounds. So our, our core earliest relationship with ourself was formed from the feeling that something is wrong and it must be me. At the core of our being, it is a little kid who believes that he or she is unworthy and unlovable. And that was the foundation that we built our concept of self on. And I think that's quite interesting what he said there because, you know, I mean, a lot of people have, have, have these feelings and some people have, have these feelings and they may not have even been abused. They still may feel unworthy, uh, you know, unworthy and unlovable, right? But especially people who have been abused can quite often feel that way. Um, not everybody, but I know so I know myself, I do. And it's, uh, that's what I was talking about, this whole, this kind of brought this on, was this whole idea of being unwanted and being um, unloved, you know. And so, and people would say, oh, your parents loved you. They must have loved you, you know. And I, I think my dad is now almost 90 years old now, and he does tell me that he loves me. And he tells me, that he always, he tells the whole the family, the remaining members, there's only a couple of us left, that he loved the whole family. He always says, you know. But when we were growing up, we didn't hear that. We didn't hear that out of his mouth. We never heard, he would never say he loved his children. Never, never, ever. The whole time I was growing up, I never heard him say he loved his wife or that he loved his children. That's when I needed to hear it. Right? Not now. You know what I mean? Like now, it's a, it's a little bit late. I really don't care now if he loves me or not. It makes no difference to me, period. But what really bothers me is the fact that the man could not show or even say that he loved his family, that he loved his children, that he loved his wife um, the whole time we were growing up. I mean, and that's right into adulthood. That's not from the age of three to four. I mean, we're talking from zero to, you know, let's say 25, 30 years old. In 30 years, I never heard the man say that he loved his children, you know what I mean? But he just all of a sudden decided that he did later on, right? And it's kind of like, well, it's a little late there, Dad, especially after the abuse he put on my on our mother that I still recall very clearly and, and very, very cognitively. It's very sad what people do. My mother, she was uh, bipolar, so she had good days and bad days. <laughs> she was manic depressive. She would, she would go through days where she was... Uh, you know, if she was pretty pretty mellowed out, nothing too horrible was going on in the home. You know, she could be kind of a decent person. She wouldn't sit around saying, "Oh, I just love my children." She wasn't a loving person. Like, she wasn't the type to to hug you or to hold you or to 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 say too many nice things to you. Even if you walk in the room from school, coming home from the school, you know, she wouldn't say, "Oh, how was your day? I hope you had a lovely day." You know, I hear other people's parents saying stuff like that. Right? That's where I kind of got all this from, not from my own parents. Um, you know, I mean, she was uh, really quite unloving as far as that goes. She she made very clear that she didn't love us and that she didn't love me especially. And I was kind of the last child in it that she could pick on, and she made a real good... She was... Like, I, I look back on it now, and I think of her age when I was this age, and it was right around my age right now. So my mother would have been right around my age right now when a lot of the, a lot of the horrific abuse started, right? So I think about, well, how old she was at that time, and I'm thinking, how could you do that to a child? I know myself, looking at the situation, I don't see how she could be like the age that I am right now and do the things that she did and say the things that she did to me and to other people in my family. You know, it's just mind-boggling. But she was just a sick woman, and she really needed help, and we, we really should have been removed from the home, I tell you that. But, you know, she never um, really, she never said, oh, I love my kids, you know. I love you. She wouldn't tuck us in at night and say, oh, I love you, sweet dreams, or anything like that, you know. Uh, we didn't get any of that. So, like, our parents were loveless. They had, the, the main reason was they had no love for each other, and they really had no love for themselves, and so they did not show us any love, right? And that 
they quite often, especially my mom, would tell us that we were that we were just not worth anything to her and that we were just worthless. My dad would tell us that we were just from the devil and that we should just die because we were just old demon seed, you know. And uh, and this is just the type of stuff we had to listen to on a regular basis. So that's not a very healthy environment for, for children to grow up in. And so, you know, it's so that the core of our being is a little kid who believes that he or she is unworthy and unlovable. And that was the foundation that we built our concept of self on. And that's horrific. And that's what basically what I'm working through right now is this idea that I... I do count, you know, I do matter. And that's what happened when I started my healing journey four years ago. You know, I started to say to myself, I do count, I do matter. You know, I am worth it. Like, and, you know, just doing a lot of self, self, like, uh, self affirmations, whatever you want to talk, whatever you want to call them, but positive affirmations, you know, talking positively instead of negatively about myself and starting to, um, you know, believe it. Not just say it, but actually believe it. Right, and so that's the big issue. You can say stuff all you want, but whether you believe it or not is another thing, right? And a lot of times people will say, "Oh, you, you are worth it. You are, you know, you're a good person." But I have to believe that on the inside of me, or I'll never realize it. I'll never see it. Um, and that's, you know, it's a matter of believing this stuff. And so I, I really, you know, I had to look back because I've done it four years of my healing journey now. So I've really, but I've always been looking back anyway because of the the abuse, you know. And I mean, I look back at that child and I think she was not a bad child no I was not a bad kid right I mean I I did the normal kid stuff getting a little bit of trouble and doing some stupid things of course kids do stupid things and I thought man I sure did not deserve to be treated that way (laughs) you know what I I just look back at my own story and uh, let alone somebody else's and I think why why do people do this to their children you know what I mean like that's so horrific to do to a child people think how you know that's why a lot of people have a hard time believing that people could do these things to a child because anyone in their right mind, anybody with 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 a with a with a half a brain and half a heart knows that you do not do these things to children. You know, it's so incredibly wrong, and you know, it's it's almost seems like there's just no way a person could be so horrific and so so horrible to a child. But it but it's it does happen, and it happens all the time. It happens more than people know. That people will take their garbage out on their children, right? And whether it's emotionally, you know, psychologically, emotionally, verbally, physically, and sexually, and every other way, you know, that these people in this child's life will will dump their garbage on this child, and that child will be forced to have to deal with this, you know. And that's the thing. I mean, this baggage and this garbage really does not belong to me. So, I, I mean, I realized that long, you know, well, four years ago, I was, I felt like I had this necklace around my neck. I talked about this on many shows before. This necklace that my parents had given me full of all this horrible stuff, you know. It was just weighing me down. It was just hanging around my neck, you know. And I thought, why am I carrying this thing around, man? This is their garbage. This is this is their garbage. This is their pain. This is their misery. This is their their evilness and suffering and, and, and uh, all the horrible things they did to me. It was all put on this necklace around my neck. And I thought, why am I even keeping this thing? Like, this is ridiculous. It doesn't even belong to me. So I got mad. I know a lot of times I think certain people out there that talk about ownership of all this. And I, for me, in my mind, there's no possible way that I'm going to own that necklace. You know what I mean? Like, I threw that thing away. As a matter of fact, I don't even have it anymore because of this this imaginary necklace around my neck. I, I basically imaginarily, in my own mind, took it off my neck and threw it away, and it's gone. <laughs> you know? Because I'm like, there's no possible way I'm going to own that abuse. You know what I mean? Like, that did not belong to me. I did not deserve to be treated like that. And, I mean, I don't know. At some point, I just have to learn to accept myself uh, for who I am, you know, and accept this little person that's inside of me and learn how to, you know, to move forward from there. But I'm not taking any ownership from this garbage because it was not mine, <laughs> you know? Like, I mean, I'll take ownership for what, what belongs to me and what I've done personally to myself. Um, you know what I mean, the things that I've done, you know what I mean, that I can take ownership of, but I refuse to take ownership from a, a sibling that sexually used me as a child. I refuse to take ownership for that. That has, has nothing to do with me. That was his choice, you know. Like, he made a choice to, to hurt me. It was a violent sexual attack, and you know. Like, he, he made a choice. And so, that was not mine. I threw, that was on that necklace, too. I just threw away. I thought, man, that does not belong to me. Get that thing away from me, man. You know, like I deserved so much better. So now, you know, I I don't have that weight around my neck anymore. I don't have, because I visualized myself doing that, you know, it got rid of a lot of the pain and the misery that I was carrying around inside of me just because I I realized that I was wearing this thing 
that wasn't even mine. It, didn't, it was all their garbage put on me. You know, and now I just have to learn how to get how to uh, love the person that I am now. <laughs> you know, and love the person that I was as a child and begin to you know, to look back at it and say, "Wow, I, you know, I was a beautiful child." You know, I, I was uh, a good child, you know, because I was actually I really was a loving child. Actually, I, I don't know how it happened growing up in that home. People, that's why I think people have a hard time believing my story. But all you have to do is take a look at some of my brother's photos. My brothers were not like me. They had, um, they grew up in the same home I did, and they were being abused horribly by my dad. And in who knows how many ways. I mean, I don't know if there was sexual abuse in there or not. I, I kind of think there might have been. But the thing is, because my dad was sexually uh, deprived from my mother because he was having to rape her. So, I mean, it kind of makes me wonder if he didn't, you know, if it didn't spread over to my brothers, because I saw some stuff that made my hair stand up. You know what I mean? I just couldn't believe what I was seeing when I was a young girl. And so I kind of think my dad sexually used my brothers, you know. But I can't prove it. So what do you what do you do about that? I mean, you can't really do anything about that. But I just I, I just have a feeling and I, from these from these past visions in my mind, you know. And, I mean, it's it's just like my brothers, especially, you know, one of my brothers, you know, I mean, he, he they didn't have the same attitude that I did. I don't know how I got to have love in my heart in that situation because I was born into this mess, born into this hell. But my brothers weren't like that. They didn't really have, uh, they didn't really have that going for them, you know. And even later in life, they didn't have that going for them because they were so wounded. They were so damaged. Like I remember my brother because there was no, there was no normal um, inter- interactions between my our parents on any level, and so my brother actually asked my sister when he would because when they got older I was probably, I don't know eight or so nine years old or something, and my sister would have been five years older than me so she would have been like thirteen fourteen years old. My brother actually asked her how to talk to girls, and what this whole thing about dating was all about, and he would have been. 16, 17 years old because he was he was a couple of years older than her, and so you know my and she, my sister said he had no clue, no no absolutely no clue on how to talk to a girl, and it's like and that's the issue like there was no normal stuff in our house period, you know what I mean like we had except for my mom used to make cookies that was probably about one of the most normal things that my mother would do, um, but I'm talking about interactions I'm not talking about stuff like grocery shopping. You know, I'm talking about normal, like, I'm talking about relationships. There was no normal stuff in our home as far as as, uh, as the the a healthy relationship between the adults, between the, the siblings, right? And so nobody knew how to do anything, <laughs> including how to even talk to a girl or how to talk to a guy. I mean, I was petrified of, of guys, of boys, and that's just because I was watching my dad abuse my mother, you know? And watching him abuse my brothers, and you know, and watching and, and having to deal with the abuse myself from him, you know, and I was just thinking, you know, and and listening to the stuff that my mother would say, just horrific, you know, like I thought, oh, there's no possible way that I would want to have a, a relationship, you know, with another person, like no, no way, and especially a marriage. I mean, marriage to me still today is, is a real problem, <laughs> you know, I just don't trust it. You know what I mean? It's like a piece of paper doesn't make or say, what is what is a piece of paper? You know, somebody can have a piece of paper and they can beat the shit out of you and kill you. Uh, whereas you may not have a piece of paper, but you might be with the most loving person in your life that you could ever imagine. So what's a piece of paper? Who cares? Um, I don't like that whole thing. You know, like for me, I like to be able to think that, hey, marriage turns sour, off I go. You know, and so whatever it is, uh, you know, relationship-wise, you know, that's my still my safety mechanism of saying I don't have to you know, stay in, in abuse, right? I refuse. And so, you know, that whole marriage idea to me is not a good idea. But, you know, I'm always happy when other people get married. I think it's great. And, you know, it's nice. And I, I've been a bridesmaid quite a few times. Um, I just refuse to get married myself. <laughs> Absolutely don't. don't, don't uh, doesn't go with what I believe in. But, um, you know, that's the thing. It's It's just so incredibly harsh that, you know, we have to go back and fix all of this stuff that was put on us that really we had nothing to do with. It wasn't even our fault. You know, I look back at the at the physical abuse and the verbal abuse coming from my mother or even my dad. And I think, my God, you know, why how could you treat your kids like that? You know? Like why would they have done that to me? I was not a bad kid. What they did was they turned me into a bad kid. 
right? Like, I myself didn't start out that way, right? You know what I mean? Like, they, they turned me into this into this monster child, really, who was full of anger and hatred because of what they were doing to me and then made me pay the price for it. And so that's my issue with my, my inner child is that, you know, I was a good kid until they got a hold of me, <laughs> you know? And so, how dare they? They 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 trashed me. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I I was I'm I'm I was I'm you know they they damaged me. They completely trashed me. I was a good kid, and they turned me into a very very um, hateful um, and an angry child. You know, and it's like that makes me angry. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't take the blame for that. That was not my fault. You know, they had their choice. They they had, they could have made the choice to not hurt their children, but they just decided not to do that. It was a choice my parents made. It's a choice the abuser makes. You know, my brother could have chosen not to sexually abuse me too, right? But he didn't make the right choice. So, you know, he made a choice. People aren't forced to do this stuff. They do this because they want to. So, you know, that's the whole thing, right? We have to get back. You know, it's hard, but we have to get back in touch with ourselves from that from from that long ago, whoever the abuser was, and we have to learn how to sort of go from that point and start loving ourselves and start nurturing ourselves and, and comforting ourselves whatever way that we can that, that works for us, you know, because everybody's different. And, um, but that's kind of where I'm at, like right now, is still working on some of this inner job work because I know that, you know, part of me feels pretty okay now, four years into my healing journey, I actually feel really, really quite good. And, um, but then part of me is still stuck, you know, because I still have uh, some things I need to work through. So I realize that. I'm like, okay, well, I just got to get back in touch with some of those some of those issues and some of those feelings, work through it, work through it, and work through it. Um, but it's a huge difference from you know four years ago. But the, but um, this the rest of this article just goes on to talk about this. Is the children are master manipulators? That is their job to survive in whatever way works. So we adapted defense systems to protect our broken hearts and wounded spirits. It says the four year old learned to throw tantrums or be real quiet or help clean the house or protect the younger siblings or be cute and funny, etc. Then we got to be seven or eight and started being able to understand ca- cause and effect and use reason and logic. And we changed our defense systems to fit the circumstances. It says then we reached puberty and didn't have a clue what was happening to us and no healthy adults to help us understand. So we adapted our defense systems to protect our vulnerability. And then we were teenagers and our job was to start becoming independent and prepare ourselves to be adults. So we changed our defense systems once again. It says it's not only functional, it's ridiculous to maintain that what happened in our childhood did not affect our adult life. And we have layer upon layer of denial, emotional dishonesty, buried trauma, unfulfilled needs, etc., etc. Our hearts were broken, our spirits wounded, our minds programmed dysfunctionally. The choices we have made as adults were made in reaction to our childhood wound programming. Our lives have been dictated by our inner, our wounded inner, inner children. Right. And so I think what you know it's very interesting what he said there. You know what I mean? That we... Most people, you know, some people, uh, you know, depending on, on you know, how resilient they were and, and all kinds of different things, you know, are able to walk free from this stuff. But there's so many people who have been abused and who've grown up in dysfunctional homes, um, you know, that have a real hard time in life later on, you know, and have to really work through this stuff. But the, what I say is, uh, you know, get the help that you need, you know. Like whatever it is, whether it's, you know, talking to a counselor or a therapist, you know, uh, you know, Self-help, a group support, whatever it is. But you surely, you know, you certainly deserve so much better as a person. I know that I did, and um, you know, I'm glad that I started my healing journey. I'm so, you know, four, four years ago, uh, coming up, well, very close to the day. I'm mean, coming up next month, so um, I just feel like, you know, I know what it's like to be on the other side of that. I remember the hell that I was in. So I know that so many people are hurting. So many people are. Uh, having such a hard time, you know, and that's why uh, pretty much why I do these shows, and as well for myself, so, um, you know, to help myself. So it's really a self-help thing for myself, right? But hopefully people will get something out of this. I hope that you will re- will believe that what I'm telling you is true. You certainly deserve better. And as adults, it's our responsibility. We have to get the help that we need. And so I would say whatever it is, you know, and if you can't cope, you know, you make sure you phone a crisis line or you phone somebody to talk to, you know, because ultimately it is our responsibility as adults to get help and to reach out. And if we don't reach out, many times people won't know. People won't know that we need help, right? And they'll just think we're we're fine, right? So that's the whole thing. I mean, you make sure that you do reach out. 
And you, I know when I started to reach out, I really couldn't believe how many hands came back to me, right? So it was really amazing. So that's my, my thing is just never give up, right? Never, ever give up. So thanks, everybody, for being here. I'll be back on tonight reading uh, another second uh, portion of La Vida Juvies. And uh, same time, same place. And I'll be back on Dreamcatchers Talk Radio as well. So have a great day, everybody. Take good care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you tonight. <laughs>